Thanks for clicking on to the Tuesday edition of Open's European Outlook. As per usual, there is a heck of a lot going on. So, um, you know, in, in recent times, I've really, really struggled to squeeze in everything that I've wanted to say. There's been times I've actually thought to myself, what I am trying to say is a bit of a waffle, and I can be a, a bit, I can get a wee bit frustrated actually at how much um, sometimes I don't understand certain things with regards to the Manjulian oscillation at the moment. It is really, really head scratching. I'm finding it hard to understand, and I, I follow uh, the lad James Peacock that's based down in Hampshire. Some of the some of the stuff that he he tweets out is amazing. Um, the knowledge, understanding that. You know things such as the Manjulian oscillation, the behaviour of the the pattern globally, depending on the influence of that Manjulian oscillation. We're in a strong phase three at the moment, and I tried my best yesterday, and I don't think I succeeded in trying to explain a little bit about the Manjulian oscillation and the potential effects it would have on the overall hemispheric scale pattern and in turn what influence that may have on both the UK as well as Europe. And I feel as if I kind of failed to really kind of, you know, explain that yesterday because quite simply I'm doing some of these videos and I don't know myself enough about these aspects, these drivers, these influences that they produce in order to explain the big picture. So... I'm sure James doesn't mind, but I'll I'll read through a couple of the tweets if I've got if I get time because I just feel as if I'm constantly running out of time and it's it's very frustrating. But I'm basically trying to show you things that are not being shown really anywhere else. There's some tremendous weather um weather channels out there, and uh, I've got massive regard for them. Um, but sometimes I feel as if they don't really explain. The nuts and bolts, the more tech stuff with regards to the 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 the, the pattern and and the drivers that produce certain certain things. So, I'm wanting to try and look into things in a little bit more detail. That's my kind of role, my target, um, my my goal, um, to try and explain and show you things that isn't being shown elsewhere. But the contrast is pretty amazing, actually, across the British Isles. Um, at the moment here, we've got temperatures as of recording at 25 past 5 in the evening. We've got temperatures well in the double figures. Uh, on the Murray Coast, we've got the 11 and 12 Celsius being achieved. We've got the 11 at 10. We've got 10.3 at Altmahara. Overnight temperature um, uh, last night was either 10.6 or 10.3. That was actually one of the warmest places the star Tuesday anywhere in, in Europe, believe it or not, away from the Aegean coastline of both Greece and Turkey, we're seeing warmer temperatures. But generally speaking, very, very unusual to see the warmest start of the day anywhere in Europe in the north of Scotland, while we had temperatures down as low as minus 8.6 at Benson in Oxfordshire, minus 7 at Pershore. So, and temperatures today struggle to get above the freezing mark in the southeast. While I believe Dice Airport at Aberdeen, northwest of the city, recorded 15.7 Celsius. So, pretty amazing stuff. And we've still got very mild conditions in play at the moment. By the way, during the night, Altenhara, while the, the, mean, the minimum temperature was 10.6, actually um, held at about 13.1 for a good part of the overnight period, while we had temperatures well below freezing further south so an incredible contrast thanks to high pressure to the south and winds coming around the top of that high has been uh, you know creating the the near 20 degree difference between north and south over the british isles but anyway this was a, a pretty common scene actually across the south of england uh, during the overnight period this is a picture from official weather uk lovely shot there but let's look at the stratosphere because, of course, there is a lot of talk at the moment with regards to uh, a non-major sudden stratospheric warming, and um, you know, uh, you know, there's been criticism over it being hyped, and I certainly hope anyway that I've not been sucked into doing that myself. There is a you know a series of minor warmings taking place 
but the likelihood now of a, a major sudden stress variant warming is down to just two percent according to uh, our good friend james peacock um, you, you can see here the difference here between what was predicted by the models versus what is now predicted by the models so we've got this stronger than normal vortex at the moment it takes a nosedive the winds the mean wind circling that polar vortex drops very significantly from uh, well above normal to well below normal. But you can see here that uh, the newer run of the model indicates that it takes that big dive, but then it recovers back above normal once again, which is quite interesting here. So, um, so basically, James goes on to say then that highest ensemble run for the 1st of February on the 19th, of January update, um, twenty one miles per second. I believe that is, uh, yeah. I told you, I don't know at all. Uh, mean for the first of February on today's update, twenty three miles per second. I could be completely talking rubbish there, by the way. And I do apologize if I do. Uh, the chance of a major sun stress variant warming on the seventh of February is down to just two percent. While that has never looked a likely event, that's a pretty shocking performance from the model. So it just shows you the difference here. Big nose dive, well below normal, holds it. Now it's showing a recovery in a fairly short space of time, which is quite interesting. This is the latest run of the GFS uh, and um, operational here, and you can see uh, what the model is showing here. So we're starting to see the first uh, of strong warming pushing towards the, the polar vortex. It pushes the vortex into North America and indeed across the North Atlantic and the Western Europe here. Then wave two comes about as we push towards the very end of the month, beginning of February. As you can see here, it never really truly penetrates the vortex. It never splits it. One piece doesn't go into North America, the other into Western Europe. But what I would say, folks, is, uh, and even though some of the modeling does not see coupling, so downward propagation of energy from the stratosphere down through the troposphere, which is essentially really what you need to see happen in order for the weather to have impacts. That strap warming needs to filter down through the column to affect the weather pattern at 500 millibars. And the modeling is not seeing that downward transfer. But I still believe, personally speaking anyway, that this strong, you know, one, two, even three waves of strong warming affecting the vortex, decelerating the winds uh, and stretching the vortex. I still believe that they were going to have impacts mid and late February. But what I do see actually taking place here is I think we're going to, um, I'm, I'm getting more confident that we're going to see the core of coldest air over Asia at the moment, where we're seeing, of course, the all-time records in China. We've seen extreme cold in the Koreas, Japan, Mongolia, and points further south, I think what we're going to start to see happen is we're going to see the core of coldest air transfer into North America. And as you can see here, as I play through the loop, so this is a two meter temperature anomaly chart here. You notice here that we're starting to lose the cold compared to normal anyway, across Asia. And we're starting to replace that uh, and, and push it into North America. And I believe what's going to happen is as we look at the strong warming taking place here over the Asia to North America side of the Arctic, that favors a strong positive North Atlantic oscillation and a strengthening of the jet stream over the Atlantic. So I think as we progress through at least the first 10 days of February, we're going to increase the jet stream because we're increasing the thermal gradient over North America, we're going to then start to kick off a stronger jet stream over the over the Atlantic. Do we start to see the first named storm in the season, very end of January, possibly into the month of February? I think our increases of seeing a named storm, by the way, increases as we progress into the month of February. That is my hunch anyway. But just because the Atlantic may be raving up, doesn't necessarily mean that we're in for a mild pattern. We can't, with, like, with these uh, pushes of Arctic air into North America, what sometimes happens is, and what we will have, by the way, is we're going to have a, a resistant high over the southeast of the United States. So as Arctic air presses south, 
We've got milder with the southeastern half of the United States. We're increasing that thermal gradient, which therefore forces the jet stream to strengthen in between that out into the Atlantic. And what we I think we're going to have is we're going to have back and forths between pushes of mild versus uh, cold surges, especially behind areas of low pressure. So increased storm strength, possible wind events, and probably an increase in big swings in temperature. We could see some very significant surges of mild, by the way, as well as significant slaps of cold, especially on the backside of these areas of low pressure. So we're definitely increasing the strength of the jet stream with this Arctic air. Now, notice the difference here. This is Friday, the 3rd of February. So this is next Friday, a week in Friday. You can see here that... Um, what we've got going here is we've got a lot less cold over Asia and notice the core of coldest air compared to normal anywhere in the planet is now over North America as opposed to Asia. So we're going to start to see record, possibly record warmth coming back into places like China, places that were shivering, uh, you know, at the moment, these places are going to start to significantly warm up. Uh, compared to the average here and then what you do is you start to increase the strength of the jet stream and if we look at Europe here you can see what takes place uh, with the anomaly here so let's go back to the current period of course warm across much of the northern half of the British Isles still lingering cold over the south what also takes place is quite interesting here is as we start to see uh, the milder air starting to filter a little bit further south notice here france and spain portugal southern europe actually remains fairly chilly but it's as we progress into the early portion of february you notice these wild swings mild surge ahead of an area of low pressure cold comes in in the back side look at this pulse of very cold air coming off north america so these areas of low pressure essentially drag that cold off the continent across the Atlantic and into the British Isles. But ahead of it, look at Europe, look at the UK. Very, very mild conditions surge north. Their circulation, don't have to be a meteorologist to work out that this is the circulation centre here. Very cold in the backside, very mild conditions ahead of that system. Then as that cold front pushes through, we're in the colder conditions, as you can see. So... It definitely looks as if we're becoming a lot more active as we progress into the early portion of February here. And uh, that's going to be quite interesting to see, I think, as we go forward here. Looking at the... Um, let's have a look and see what other tweets we can find here. To try and show you things. Uh, like I say, a little bit frustrating at the moment. I'm struggling. I find at times to be able to explain myself properly. And... Um, I don't like it when I can't uh, share with you exactly what I think's happening and uh, and I don't fully understand what's going on myself because the physics is just over my head. This is uh, the, the CFSV2, by the way, for the, the month of February. Notice here a positive North Atlantic oscillation, but it looks as if we could be slightly negative in terms of the Arctic oscillation. We've got strong positive here over the North Pacific Alaska and also on the north coast of Asia. That, to me, tells me that it's forcing the core of coldest air into North America, increasing that gradient, and then, of course, forces a stronger jet stream. But what happens with the stratospheric polar vortex, the influence that warming has in the upper levels of the atmosphere, does that have an impact mid to late February? And, of course, we need to also take into account the behaviour of the Madden Julian Oscillation is strong in phase 3 at the moment. I think it's going to rotate into warmer phases. So as it progresses through the Indian Ocean into the continental maritime region here, that may set off. But it also some of the models are indicating that it rotates back into more favourable colder phases. So I think what's interesting and what one of, one of the things that I noticed on, on, on Twitter actually by some of these experts was that the reason why we're not getting a sudden stratospheric warming proper is it looks as if the wave breaking wasn't strong enough to affect from troposphere up into the stratosphere. That's what I think is the reason for that. Out of time, but I feel as if I've covered some more. 
Enjoy the rest of your day. See you.